So just so you know, the background for day, today's talk is really to start to give people, uh, share some of the experience that we've gained over the years on both venture and angel investing. Uh, share you a little bit of sort of the thinking which comes from uh, decades of experience in the space. And I think we'll cook things off right now. Others can join in as they come, but uh, let me just start things off. So welcome to Secrets of Angel and Venture Investing. Um, just as background before we walk through this, um, so I'm Kamal Hassan. I'm one of the founding partners of Loyal VC. Um, after an in initial career as an engineer, um, uh, MBA management consultant, I spent 20 years as an entrepreneur. 15 years of that, I did angel investing, uh, including helping coordinate an angel group. Uh, uh, in fact, a, a global angel group back when that was quite rare. And um, I, I then spent uh, seven years uh, first uh, running, then designing accelerator programs for the Founder Institute. Uh, so I learned a little bit um, through that. And over that period, uh, I've actually, uh, and more recently, I've been a, a founding partner of Loyal VC. Over that period, I've uh, advised over 500 entrepreneurs. So certainly seen a lot of different angel and venture deals um, done, both the ones I participated in and advising different entrepreneurs. And um, uh, yeah, and I'm joined on the call here by Nidhi Vermani, who's one of the venture partners with Loyal VC, who's also um, an experienced uh, uh, experienced business person and investor in her own right. Uh, but let's just jump into things now. So as mentioned, if you have questions as we go, please do feel free to put them into the chat. Um, but we'll just sort of take a, uh, a quick sort of walk through. If you start looking at early stage investing, this is the sort of steps that companies traditionally move through. So most companies will start off at the idea stage self-funding, this is exactly what Jeff Bezos did in Amazon, for instance, he started the business with his own money. You then will move on and as you have a first rough product together, you will typically raise money from people who know you already, friends, family, um, other sort of close acquaintances. Um, and Jeff raised 245,000 from his parents, Mike and Jackie Bezos in 1994. From there, people move on to raising money from strangers, so angel investors, individual investors who they don't know personally. And you typically can do this as you're just starting to make initial sales for your business. Tom Alberg, for instance, was an angel as out of Seattle who invested 50,000 into Amazon in 1994. After that, companies will move on to venture capital. Now, venture capital is really appropriate for the growth stage. It is to help already successful businesses grow faster. Kleiner Perkins was the example here who put 8 million into Amazon in 1995. And from there, companies have two choices. They can continue raising round after round of larger venture capital or from private equity funds, or they can list on the stock markets. Everything in green here is referred to as the public markets or uh, sorry, is the private markets or there's the public stock markets, of course, um, down here in gray. And that's what Amazon did as they listed in 97, uh, raising $54 million. Now, um, when we think of investing our money, most people think about public companies, the public stock markets. Um, it's fairly obvious. I mean, most people understand that over 99% of all companies are private, um, that there's only a few thousand public companies. Uh, but what most people don't realize is that private companies are responsible for over half of the total economy uh, by sales. So when you think about investing your money, um, many of us have very detailed strategies for how we invest in the public markets, but don't think a lot about the private markets. So that's what we'll really be focusing on today is help you understand how to access this hidden half of the economy. If you want to invest in technology, you really need to start thinking about accessing private companies. And there's been a trend over the past 20 years. Um, originally, if you wanted to invest in tech companies, you could simply wait until they last listed like Amazon did in 1997 or Microsoft back in 1986. Investors who bought Amazon and Microsoft on listing could make over 2000 times their money back in the public markets. If you look more recently, however, with companies like Google, Facebook, or even most recently Uber, um, tech companies are staying private longer and longer. They raise more and more rounds in the private markets. So by the time they list, there are diminishing returns for public market investors. And really retail investors have very little chance right now 
to participate in these gains. So if you want to access the tech returns, you really have to invest in angel, as an angel in venture capital or in private equity funds. There is starting to be a trend of SPACs, which is a way to get some tech companies to list earlier, but that's still tiny compared to the number of companies in the sort of the venture PE space. Now, if you want to invest in this space, there are some rules to be aware of. And effectively, the biggest one to be aware of is that there are investor protection rules, which mean that only accredited investors can invest in private market companies. Now, accreditation doesn't mean anything about how smart you are at any exams you pass, nothing like that. It's purely, are you wealthy enough? So for instance, in the US, the rules are personal income of 200,000 a year, family income of 300,000 a year, financial assets, not including your home of a million dollars. If you have 301,000 in family income, you are considered an accredited investor. If you have 299,000, you are not. So you can see it's fairly artificial rule, but this is really there to help. The original concept was to protect people from being taken advantage of. Now, of course, this originally started back in 1933. And if you look nowadays, where you can buy all sorts of assets online, where you can even sort of buy on eBay something from someone shipping a product from Mexico or China or whatever it is, and things follow through, it seems a little bit old fashioned to have these rules in place, but they are in place in most countries. I'll talk a tiny bit about how you can invest if you're not an accredited investor in private markets. But the honest truth is most private market investments, you need to be wealthy enough. In some countries, they call this a qualified investor, a sophisticated investor, but it all means only the wealthy can access this asset class. So if you want to start talking, uh, start talking about the secrets of angel and venture investing, the number one truth you need to learn is that deals are individually risky. Most angel and venture capital deals will fail. And in fact, when Jeff was raising the money for Amazon from his parents, he walked to them and he said, there is a 70% chance that you won't see this money back again. And this is fairly unusual. If you compare it to public markets where you only have about 1% of companies fail each year. So over a 10 year period, typical for angel venture capital, you're going to only have 10% of the companies fail as opposed to 70%. And in private equity, it's still higher, but still only about one in five deals or around 20% who fail. So a lot of risk in the individual deals. However, um, this risk is made up for by the results. If you look at the deal by deal returns, in actual fact, the actual data, Jeff said originally 70%, it's 65% of venture deals fail. And these are deals which make it to the venture capital stage. You then have about 31% of your deals, which give you between one to 10 times your money back. It's an average of around 3.3 times your money back. So for the first 96% of your investments, you break even roughly. The last 4% of your deals, one in 25 deals are what's called home runs, which give you 10 times your money back or more. And remember these sorts of 10, 20, 50 times, 100 times, even a thousand times returns are things which are very hard to get nowadays in the public markets. But this is where you, it's sort of in venture capital is very much an outsized return business. Now, it's actually okay that you've got this very high failure rate of two thirds or 65% because of the magic of diversification. And there's a reason somebody won a Nobel Prize for this. If you have five investments in venture capital, you could lose all your money or angel, or you could make a lot of money back again. But as you increase the number of investments to 15 investments, then 50 investments, then 150 investments, you can see that the risk on a portfolio level goes down quite a bit. Your median return also goes up from around 7% with only five investments up to sort of 12, 13% with 150 investments because your median portfolio at 150 has around 
six um, home runs in it. So you're starting to see statistically a very good and very interesting distribution, especially relative to public market investing. So the first thing which you wanna hammer into yourself if you are going to invest in this space is you must diversify. If you only do five angel deals and they all fail, that's not the fault of the asset class. That's your fault for not managing the risk appropriately. Diversify, typically you wanna see around 100 deals or plus. Now, besides this diversification, there's a couple of other things to watch out for. You need to do diligence on the deals because they're private companies and some people are going to lie to you, mislead them. There were mislead you. There's a great study out um, from the Angel Capital Association, which said angels who do at least 20 hours of diligence on deals have double the returns of those who don't, presumably because they allow them to catch deals which are more likely to fail. A second thing to watch out for is negative selection bias. You should always be asking yourself when you see a deal, why is this deal available to me? What makes me special that I got to see this and nobody else did? Because deals which people feel are the best are typically going to get funded the first. So you should always be asking yourself, is this a good, uh, how did this deal come to me? Why do I see it? Um, the third thing to watch out for if you are going to do angel or venture investing is that there are long times to exit. Your money is locked away for 10 years or more. And just to give you a breakdown here, the reason it's locked away is because companies take a long time to give you your money back. It takes a median of seven years for 50% of M&As, a median of close to nine years for half of IPOs to, to happen. And it can take 12, 14 years. My best angel investment that I've made gave me 30 times my money back. That company also took 14 years from the day I invested until the day I got, I got paid back. So you can see this is not an investment class that you're typically in for money immediately. It's something where you invest now, for instance, for your children's education. That's the sort of money you're putting into something like this or your retirement. Um, it also, if you're going to do this, takes a fairly long time to fail. It takes three years for half of the companies that are going to fail that show up six years for most of them. So still, you can see your failures much more quickly than your successes, but it's still a fairly long-term business. Now, why would you do it with all these headaches? Well, one of the reasons is it is actually really fun to do angel and venture investing. And one of the best parts about it is you get good stories to tell when you're sitting around with friends uh, after dinner, wherever. And here, for instance, are four of the companies from our own portfolio. We've got Avant Meats, an alternative meat company in China, growing fish collagen in, in vats rather than uh, catching fish and killing them to get uh, the <laughs> swim bladders, uh, shark fins, whatever it is. Um, so fun, exciting story, great for the environment. We have Beta Store, an e-commerce company out of Nigeria. They are, um, you could call them a mini Amazon for doing B2B supply of small retailers who run these small kiosks and stores scattered around the cities. We have FBB Biomed, a biotech company out of the US, um, doing very interesting things as one of the America's first RNA virologists doing interesting. And we have Total Control, a clean tech company out of Norway who helped provide uh, software to, to, so that restaurants grocery stores, et cetera, can reduce their wasting of fresh food. So you can see all of these stories are really fun stories to sit around after dinner and talk about. And you can feel that you're doing really exciting things to help the environment, to help developing world, to help um, medicine and human health advance. So there's a lot of really fun things you can, yeah, there's a lot of psychic benefit out of angel and venture investing. If you are going to do this, and we'll spend some time now talking about the different approaches, the main questions you should be asking yourself when you do this is, first of all, is this something you're going to do casually a few hours per month? And there's a series of strategies. Or is this something which is going to be an important part of your life activity where you're spending sort of, say, 20 hours per month on, in which case you consider being an active
active angel or what's called a spray and pray angel. And the big difference there is the other question you need to ask yourself is, is angel investing or investing generally in angel or classic VC fund something you do for fun? Is it something you do to get good stories, but you understand that this is pure gambling because you're only doing a few investments and the returns are completely unknown? Or are you doing it to make money? In which case you should see the 100 plus investments and then there's a different series of strategies to follow. I'll spend a few minutes telling you a little bit about each of them right now. So your first option and one option which is available to you if you are not an accredited investor is you can invest in crowdfunding platforms, equity crowdfunding platforms. Cedars uh, out of the UK, um, uh, Crowdcube out of the UK are some good examples. This is legal in, it's starting to become legalized in many countries. There'll be specific platforms which are legal in your own countries, but the UK is further ahead in this space than many others. The advantages of an online platform is there's lots of deal flow and hopefully the platform does some diligence for you. <laughs> the downside, is there's a lot of negative selection bias. You see only the things which are available on the platform, and then you've got some other risks in there as well. But this is a great way to get in there, do a little bit of playing with relatively small amounts of money. You can do this often with only a few thousand dollars if you want to just get into the space. The next step up is to be an angel investor where you invest directly in companies. Now, the first option here is to be an angel in companies you already know started by friends and family. Um, the advantage of the friends and family is that you have minimal diligence required. You already know these people, you can trust them. And you could do this from a motivation of just helping out people that you know, helping out your friends and family. Sometimes they'll even consider it a loan and pay you back even if the business fails. The downside is there's very few deals available. There's only so many friends and family you have that you can invest in. Um, and then of course, there's the downside of all angel investments. You have a long time to exit. You have very little visibility. There's also a specific risk that many times professional investors will structure their deals to clean up the cap table and get rid of the early investors, including friends and family, with relatively low returns. But this is certainly a first place to start. You can also become a sort of general angel investor where you're investing anywhere between $10,000 and $100,000 amounts in businesses started by strangers. This is a lot of fun to do. It's really good for the ego, honestly. You've got all these entrepreneurs who want your money, so they are really going to make you feel good about yourself. And you've got great bragging rights to be the person who discovered the next Amazon, whatever it is. Um, one famous example here is Ron Conway, who's a famous spray and pray angel investor out in Silicon Valley. He's done hundreds of deals there and I believe has been in things like Twitter, etc. cetera. Um, the downside of being an individual angel is it's relatively hard to get deal flow on your own. I've done this. And it's amazing. You, uh, when you're an entrepreneur, you think, oh, it's, it's so um, hard to find investors. This is a very inefficient market. You don't want to put something up on your uh, social media saying, come to me, I'm an angel investor, because you'll spend a lot of time saying no to people. And there's a lot of sort of just crazy pitches out there. If you want really good pre-filtered pitches, you can't advertise, so then you need to find ways to get people to come to you. And you have some of the same risks of being pushed out later by some professional investors. Now, if you are an angel investor, there's three choices here. You can be what's called an active angel, which is getting involved in the company, giving them advice, helping them out with your experience. This is great fun. You're also unlikely to be compensated well for the extra time you spend there. And there's a danger of giving advice um, uh, of being listened to when you shouldn't be because you sound like the expert, but you know the business less well than the founders themselves do. Your next option is to be a passive investor who doesn't spend a lot of time giving advice. You pick some favorite deals, it's a lot of fun. And then after that, you just sort of sit back, support them when they ask for it, but don't really get involved. This is something which simply needs patience. In both 
of these active and passive investment strategies, you're probably only going to be doing a handful of deals, maybe 10, 20 at the most. And if you do, you're going to have a fairly risky return because you don't have the diversification. If you want to diversify and do 100 plus deals, you become what's called a spray and pray angel, um, which is, I mean, this is really the only investment grade strategy where you do a whole bunch of investments where you must be passive because you can't get actively involved in all these companies. But at the same time, it's taking up a lot of your time because you have so many investments that you're making. It can still be a lot of fun, but there is a time cost to supporting all these companies. There is, um, uh, just to underline what I was saying earlier about the power of diversification, uh, the head of data science and AngelList, they did a study of all the companies listed on AngelList, one of the platforms, major ones in the US. And they said that at the seed stage, indexing, so buying a large, basically buying every company beats 90 to 95% of investors picking deals. Um, and this comes back to the math I showed you earlier. If you are an angel, you don't have to do it alone. You can also pay a few thousand dollars to join a group, attend monthly pitches. This will look a lot like Shark Tank, Dragon's Den, what you're used to. You've got a team of people who will gather deals, filter them for you. They will advertise. They will screen out the crazies. You're paying these people to do that work for you. And then you can walk into the room and hear a bunch of pitches. You get a chance to hear from a bunch of other people. You've got people to share your diligence with. The difficulty is that angel groups are often quite slow uh, to get deals done. There's a lot of politics back and forth. So it's the strengths and the disadvantages of any group. You can decide that you don't want to spend the time doing the investing yourself and instead invest in a venture fund, get someone else to do the work for you. You're going to end up paying them about 20 to 30% of your money in return. The advantage is that someone's doing that work and you've got a known time to exit. Most venture funds have a fixed 10 year lifetime, but of course you can't touch your money for the 10 years. They also have these lovely things called capital calls where you are obliged to make further payments over a three or four year period into the fund. And if you don't, you can potentially lose your investment. Um, here's a couple of things to watch out for. Venture funds will be limited partnerships um, for tax reasons. Uh, you're typically going to have to sign, read and sign sort of a hundred pages worth of documents to sign up. That's just the way by law that you have to read all these papers. Um, I mentioned capital calls you'll be paying in over multiple years. Standard fees you pay are 2 and 20. 20% of your profits, 2% annual management fee. But this is sort of the standard thing. So I'll answer any questions you have about venture funds at the end. Um, one of the things to watch out for, for with venture funds is that venture funds really only invest in one gender. So if you look at the venture capital industry as a whole, only 3% of dollars go to companies with a woman CEO. Um, now, either you believe that 97% of entrepreneurial talent is in men, or you can say that perhaps VCs aren't investing in the best possible deals. And in fact, you see that, that for companies who are more data-driven, funds who are more data-driven, who are not relying on pitches, but are funding more based on the numbers and the progress, and our fund Loyal VC is one of those, you find that around 30% of the entrepreneurs, 30% uh, of the dollars are going to companies with a woman CEO. So this is something to watch out for. And you should ask if you're investing in a venture fund, ask them what percentage of their companies go, uh, percentage of the money goes to companies with a woman CEO, because you want to invest in teams who pick the best possible businesses, not just the best possible men, and to be honest, white men. Now, when we talk about investing in venture funds, another secret challenge thing to watch out for is that you can only invest in the funds available to you. And there is an interesting behavior going on in venture capital where people believe that past performance impacts future returns, however much they're told otherwise. And the conventional wisdom is whichever funds had top quartile returns in the past of genius managers, you should invest in again. And the result is some significant fraction of new managers are top quartile, 
their subsequent funds sell out quickly, especially to prior investors who say, hey, I backed you up front. You made a lot of money. Let me give you more money. And the result is that if you are investing in a venture fund, you typically find either you need to invest in new managers where people don't know if you're going to be top quartile or not, or you want experienced managers who are second or third quartile. Now, all of this naming is based on the hypothesis that venture capitalists can pick winners. First quartile says if you were first quartile in the past, you will be in the future because VCs can pick winners. And this, in fact, is how the VC industry runs right now is VCs will look at hundreds of deals for every one deal they do. They're highly selective. They screen out everything which is likely to fail and invest in only the top few winners. Now, if you look at the results here, well, I've just told you that industry-wide, 65% of VC deals fail and only 4% are home runs. Yet when VCs are investing, they are always trying to pick home runs. So VCs think they're picking home runs in every deal and yet only 4% mm -hmm. of the time are they right. I'll give you another data point here also, Bessemer Ventures, oldest VC fund in the US, here is their anti-portfolio, selected companies that they had a chance to invest in and rejected. Apple, Facebook, Google, PayPal, Tesla, Zoom. So if you're looking at this and you're saying, well, hey, you're missing, <laughs> you're saying no to Google, Facebook, and Apple, um, and you're only getting it right 4% of the time, there is an alternative hypothesis that emerges, which is to say, maybe venture capitalists don't have a crystal ball. Maybe the future is unknown and unknowable. You can bend the odds one way or the other, but you don't know for sure how things will turn out. And if so, if you're not sure how things will turn out, you should invest very differently. Fixed amounts in every credible deal to avoid missing out on these home runs, these one in 25 companies, which should be the mega winners. And just really about avoiding saying no to home runs rather than saying yes, the sort of saying no to everything which will fail. And this is reflected also in the data mentioned a little bit earlier from AngelList, which says investing in the index, investing across the asset class gives better returns 90 to 95% of the time. Look, I'm not going to tell you which one of these two hypotheses is right. You can decide that yourself with your own investing, but do keep it in mind that there are two to competing theories, which drive very different investing behaviors. What you can do as another option, if you want the diversification, and remember most venture funds only do about 20 investments, so they're not diversified enough. We know the magic number is in excess of 100, but you can go to what's called a fund of funds, who will invest your money across multiple different venture capital funds to give you enough diversification. So all of a sudden you get the diversification here across multiple funds. The downside is you have to pay the manager a fee who then pays the venture capital fund a fee as well, but it does give you that diversification. Lastly, you're, you've got another option recently, which is to invest in funds that are already massively diversified. So 500 startups is the original one here. The AngelList has a um, index fund they run. There's a right side capital management. And our own fund, Loyal, is also a diversified fund. Most of these groups, you will have to pay fairly large checks to get into. But this gives you the diversification. The downside in many of these funds is you can expect your returns to be more modest, we saw a median of sort of 12% or something is what you should be expecting in a massively diversified fund, which doesn't sound very sexy, but is really what you need to do if you're going to uh, invest in this as a financial asset class. So here then, in a simple table summary, are your different options, the pros and cons of each. You can really do the sort of the active angel, passive angel, gambling for fun, lots of fun, bragging rights, low fees because you're doing it yourself. And relatively low capital required, though it increases, but sort of with $50,000 and you're just doing a few investments, you can do five, $10,000 investments each 
and get started as an angel. Um, classic venture funds also are sort of more on the gambling for fun side, although you pay fees. Now, the downside of this gambling for fun, of course, is your returns are all over the place. You don't know what to expect. You've got a significant risk of losing money. Um, it takes time or not, depending if you go for the venture fund route, and you are always going to have a long time to exit. The same when you invest for returns, you still have the long time to exit, but you have something where you are paying more fees or spending a lot of time as a spray and pray angel, but in return for getting moderate expected returns are relatively low risk of losing money. So these are some of the different categories. You can decide for yourself whether you want to be an angel or an adventure fund and whether you want to be diversified across venture funds um, or even diversify yourself as an angel. But these are sort of the pros and cons of each. Now, we have, when we launched our fund, Loyal VC, we sat down and we looked at everything which was out there and we said, we don't like this choice. We'd like to come up with something which is a better fit. Sorry, excuse me. I think someone is screen sharing. Uh, let me continue here. Yeah. So we looked at this and we said, we don't like this mix. What can we do which is different? So we came up with an approach with Loyal VC, and I'll just give you a couple of slides on it to give you a sense of it. But we sat there and we said, hey, how can we sort of match venture capital with the sort of fun bragging rights, yet make the returns slightly more sort of more consistently and, and consistently higher, which we've done through a pilot process while still getting the diversification you need to, to, to um, protect capital. And at the same time, we also said, why should the investors wait 10 years? Yes, the assets take 10 years to invest, but why not let investors trade in and out by the assets? Now we started doing this three years ago and interesting, interestingly, less than three weeks ago, Sequoia just announced that they are also looking at a structure like this where people can trade in and out on a yearly basis in Sequoia and in a quarterly basis in the case of Loyal. So the things that set us apart, we drive systematic returns. We're doing small pilots first to get to know the companies. We operate at scale. We let our investors trade in and out because we built the fund that we wished we had available. This is just, I can't show you in a public talk like this, our fund level returns. But what I will show you is the fact that we do small pilot investments in every company to start. We start with a $10,000 pilot. And those drive around an 11% return annually, which is what you'd expect from a diversified investment base. We then do follow on investments in the top third of those companies, typically investing $200,000. We've done 50 of these investments, and you can see that we're returning around 48% a year here. So this process of pilot first to get to know the companies, invest more in the best, really seems to be driving good returns. Um, we do see that around 98% of our offers are accepted. Um, so we're doing a good job of building a relationship in the pilots to then get into the best companies because often you need to have the knowledge and the access to get into the best deals and loyal seems to be able to generate that access advantage. Um, we are diversified globally across industries. Um, and the result is, and as I mentioned, you can trade in and out. So the result is that we really created this sort of what we believe is best of both worlds. Um, but that's, that's the approach we took. Um, as you can see, it, it's derived from our knowledge of the industry, but there are many different strategies you can take here. And what we'll do now is I'd like to stop and throw it open to you uh, for questions and discussion. Now we do have few enough people here that you can probably do feel free to put questions in the chat, but you can also feel free to just unmute and uh, ask your questions uh, personally if you prefer to do that.
So any questions and or comments on things we've, we've, uh, we've talked about? I noticed there's a few people here from Bangladesh Angels. Uh, clearly you have a lot of experience in angel investing. Uh, is there anything which we talked about here which was new for you, which you found interesting? So you seem to be muted. Uh, the person from Bangladesh Angels who just tried to unmute, you still seem to be muted. Yeah, you are still muted. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, the problem is on my side then. Excuse me for a second. Uh, one second here, I will be right back with proper earphones. <laughs> Sorry, can we try again? Yeah. Hi, Kamal. Can you hear us? Or can yes, you hear me? I hear you now. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, and thank you so much for having us. Uh, we saw this is the last moment and it was a really great kind of experience for the team. Um, I, I guess, you know, so we've been in we're the first angel network in Bangladesh just to introduce us. We've been operating for three years, um, have been doing investments for the last two and have done 22 deals, a little under $3 million pre-seed stage and all companies focused on Bangladesh. Uh, and we also work closely with the Founders Institute team in Bangladesh. Uh, we have a lot of overlap at the board level. Um, you know, one of the things we're dealing with these days is especially, you know, we're still a very early stage frontier market when it comes to startups but that's changing very rapidly. There's a lot more liquidity coming in. And so, you know, founders are one, obviously wanting for quick decisions and bigger tickets, right? Um, and so this, that's where I'm kind of curious about this pilot model, because especially if you work ar around the world, you know, how do you get a founder to accept a 10K check? Uh, I mean, that's just, I'm, I'm curious about the, 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 the modality or the dynamics of it, uh, you know, sure. it, 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 yeah. So we have, uh... It was it, when we initially launched the fund, we had a lot of persuading to do to entrepreneurs to persuade them to take the money because it was like, why should I take 10,000 from you? I can take 100,000 over here. You're not worth the effort. Um, so we initially heard that comment a lot. And we had to do a lot of persuading to people to say, here's how we add value. Here's the process, et cetera. Um, because we only fund two groups. So we only fund um, graduates of Founder Institute. So top grads recommended by their local directors. And by the way, we haven't funded any from Bangladesh so far. So if you know the local directors and founders, you please have them reach out directly to me, Kamal at loyal.vc. Um, but um, because we only fund these two groups, we have now established a reputation. So we fund in alumni of INSEAD, Founder Institute uh, grads, and they talk to each other. They're both relatively closed networks. And when they hear from other entrepreneurs, hey, I got funding from Loyal. And it was amazing. And even with only their first $10,000, they provided a lot of support and help. And honestly, that's what entrepreneurs want. If you develop a reputation in the market for support and help, and let's be blunt, what do entrepreneurs really want? They want cash, introductions to cash, and they want customers. So if you can really work your angel network to help introduce them to customers, help them build their sales, their sales funnels, they will love you. And they will start, and you can start publicizing that information yourself, which is, hey, here's what other entrepreneurs we funded say. You've got 22 of them so far. Use their experience. Use them as your advocates. Use them to create your marketing materials, et cetera. Um, that, that's what we found. We still have only, well, only, it's pretty good, but we have about a 70 to 80% acceptance rate of our offers um, of the $10,000 pilots. But once a company comes in the door and takes the pilot, we have, as mentioned, that 98% acceptance rate on follow-on. So we're doing a really good job of proving ourselves through delivering value when they come in the door. So yeah, that's the advice, deliver value, use that. Um, the other thing, which uh, having been an entrepreneur for years, uh, you did, and did mention a challenge with many uh, angel groups is that you can be slow. So I would really look at how do you get an accelerated timeline from the date the angel uh, date the entrepreneur applies to you to the date the funding closes, 
really push yourself to speed up that timetable. Because that also, that's one of our advantages is we can make decisions in th two or three days and we can talk to a company, find that they've had a, some sort of inflection and be out the door to them with money by the end of the week. Now you clearly can't do that in an angel group, but it's worth pushing yourself and challenging yourself to say, can we get diligence done and term sheets out within 10 days of a meeting? How fast can we set things up? How quickly can we do things? And that also will give you the advantage. Got it. I guess, you know, uh, our CEO, Nirjar, he had to drop off because he had a little bit of technical issue and got yes. pretty much disconnected. But, we, you know, our team, we really took notes on that. Yeah, thank you for that. Perfect. Good. Any other questions? Hello, Kamal. Yeah. This is Bruno. From, from yes, London. hello, Bruno. Thanks for that. I'm, I'm uh, like the Bangladesh team. I'm, I'm, uh, I just literally heard about you guys this morning, so I'm very pleased that I could join in. Uh, in this uh, very interesting topic. I'm on the startup side. We, we, I, we, I work with a company and we are privately carving out a, a, a new company for our core product. Um, so we, we are thinking about venture capital. Um, very interesting, your approach with a pilot. It's a small ticket for us, I'll be honest. Uh, and I just, I, I didn't really grasp what I get, what do I get for 10K? And the second question is, what's the, what's the average time between the 10k and the next step yeah uh, are you, is, is this a six month period or is it a one year can you elaborate on that sure um sure if we when we ask uh, first of all i don't know bruno uh, are you an insead alumnus by any chance yes i'm 07 okay and perfect then, so then you would qualify for funding so that's great um when we ask our entrepreneurs why they take our money we get three reasons given to us in order. Reason number one is they say, look, I don't need money. You do 10,000, you do 200,000. I have lots of money. I can get money all over the place. I've got great networks. However, I love your 500 advisors and we have 500 network of 500 advisors around the world who work with us. And they say, I love those 500 advisors, the fact that you can deliver value for me right away through this amazing network. And that's great. If you never give me money, I don't care. I'm just going to take advantage of that. The next, and that's about 40%. The second 40% say, um, you know, yeah, the advice is nice. And I've got a one in three chance to get a $200,000 investment out of you. And you will lead, you will follow, you're just incredibly um, easy people to work with for a next round of financing and having a good friendly investor in my cap table already who has the capability not just to follow on at the $200,000 level, but who can follow on again at the million dollar level, who can follow on again at the $3 million level, who can keep growing with me is very attractive. Um, the last the last uh, sort of 20% of people, and this clearly wouldn't apply to you, it often applies to founder and to grads from countries like Bangladesh. In Bangladesh, actually $10,000 goes a long way. And they'll sit there and say, and by the way, that $10,000 is really nice too. In terms of with loyal, how long we spend, um, I'm just going to pull up one slide. Um, but we, um, here this is, this is how long companies take um, to move from stage to stage with loyal, but companies will take a median of 10 months to move on from one stage to the next, but it could be anywhere, you can see from the 10,000 to 200 stages taken anywhere from four months to 32 months, and from the uh, 200,000 to million stages taken anywhere from four months up to 21 months. So it's a median of 10, but it is, there is no fixed timeline. Um, you simply need to outperform the other companies at your stage, and then we'll offer you more money. I appreciate that. That's very clear. Thank you, Kamal. Perfect. But it really is the network, and this circles back to the questions from the Bangladesh Angels. It's, uh, I mean, you look at, we've got a 98% acceptance rate of follow-on offers. We're doing something right. In your case, um, uh, Bruno, because you are an NCAD alum, uh, we can probably find, and you could even just ask around, uh, other INSEAD alum uh, in your class, you'll probably find people who know us, classmates, friends who've taken our money, 
or who act in our advisor network, and you can certainly hear from them what it has been like. Um, but that's the, um, we really focus on delivering value, and it's easy to say we deliver value. <laughs> the numbers don't lie. 50 out of 51 follow-on offers accepted. Um, we're doing something right. That, and many of those are competitive situations where the investor has a choice of, sorry, the entrepreneur has a choice of investors, and they are making room for us in that round. So it is, I mean, that is the secret, deliver value, and then people want your money. Uh, thank you, Kamal. Uh, Kamal, if you don't mind, I just got another question from Bangladesh and your team, really. Yeah. Uh, could you, could you, you know, briefly elaborate on the mechanics behind the pilot fund and also maybe touch base on the time of execution and how do you set valuations and then terms within that, you know, 10, 10 days time period time? Yeah. And then also maybe touch base on how do you follow up on the, uh, or maybe what are the follow-up rounds like? Is it led by the loyal team or is it led by co-partners on the follow-up rounds? If you could maybe briefly elaborate on that. Perfect. Um, so the, the terms for the $10,000, our attitude is we just, whatever terms the entrepreneur wants to take from us, we will, wants to, to give us, we will accept. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, generally speaking, we hope they'll give us the same terms as they're giving other people, but it's only $10,000. When you're $10,000, you shouldn't be negotiating terms. You just take whatever they give because our view is the $10,000. I mean, if they set the valuation too high on the $10,000, it actually hurts them in their later fundraising. We'll just explain to them the, the, what happens to your fundraising. I mean, often a VC will say, I need to see more traction. What they aren't saying is they're saying, I need to see more traction for the stage you're at. <laughs> in other words, your valuation is too high for the amount of traction you have. Mm -hmm. So we just explain that, then they give us whatever valuation makes sense for them and we'll take it because the $10,000 is just to get to know the company, to get the, the foot in the door. And we will then negotiate and have a very strong view on valuation. We'll know what the valuation should be when we get to the $200,000 range. I mean, this at that point, you've spent months and diligence on the company. You know what's going on. That is the point at which you can say, hey, this is what you should be worth. Well, this is what I'm willing to offer you. Then it's up to the company to say yes or no to that. Um, loyal will lead. So we believe we want to invest money in the best companies. And if you're investing money in the best companies, then you know you shouldn't care whether you lead or you follow. It's if this is the company is the best one available to you, you give it, you you offer it the money. So that is that is how we think about. Um, um, yeah, that, that's how we think about the, um, the, uh, the question of lead or follow. We think that it's a, it, it's, a, it's a false choice and you shouldn't make it. You should want to invest in a good company and you should be willing to do it playing any role you need to play within the cap table to get into that deal. Um, so we will happily set terms. When Loyal does set terms, and I know this will sound very unusual, um, when we do set terms, we strongly prefer to be, we strongly prefer to invest in common shares. Now, right. most angel groups, most VCs want preferred shares. They want all sorts of protections for themselves. We think that it is better, uh, it's better in the short term to have everybody on the same terms because you won't have people fighting. You see a lot of uh, sort of cap table fights between investors, entrepreneurs, uh, founders, employees, because they have different, um, they have different instruments and hence different payoffs if certain early outcomes come up. Um, so we think it's best to that in the long term, you make more money when everyone's all pulling together. Um, the second reason we do that is it's, um, is it helps set the company on a path of not giving preferences to the next round of investors, because when you get preferences at your round, then the next round of investors will almost certainly get preferences. And the next round after that will get preferences on top of you. And you end up at the close to the bottom of the cap table stack anyway. So if you can set a habit in the company of doing common shares, of protecting the entrepreneur, but by the way, protecting the entrepreneur also protects the early investor. Um, then in the long term, you'll make more money out of that. So that is a philosophical approach we use. Um, it works very well with some companies, not with others. It's certainly not standard. 
Um, but if if they want to do uh, preferred shares, we'll take preferred shares, we'll take convertible notes, we'll take whatever they want to give the market. If we lead, we want common shares, or we will do a safe note if necessary, if pushed. Got it. Um, that was, Colin, was that all of your questions? I'm trying to remember if there were Yeah, you know, yeah, just cover. lastly, if you could maybe touch base on the execution in terms of the time, like how, how long does it usually take for you to go from due diligence stage to finally executing the deal, writing off the term sheet? Could you maybe, uh, and also for us, you know, as you rightfully said, you know, for angel networks, the common issue is that the execution might usually take a little more than, you know, individual angels, right? So if you have any suggestions on, you know, fastening up the process, that would be great. Sure. One trick. Um, so how do we do it quickly? Um, we do it by doing diligence appropriate to the stage. The amount of diligence you should do on a $10,000 investment is much less than the amount of diligence you should do for a $200,000 investment, which again is less than you should do for a million dollar investment. So we are very conscious of, given the stage, how much investment should we do? And by the way, we expect two thirds of our $10,000 uh, deals to fail. So let's not spend it, a lot of time because we do only founder institute, top founder institute grads and uh, INSEAD alumni, they are less likely to cheat us. And that's the problem you have in Bangladesh Angels is when you have open access, uh, you are more likely to run into people who are trying to cheat you. But still, a few reference checks will probably show up things to be concerned about. But in any case, so how can we do it? I mean, honestly, the amount of diligence we do on a $10,000 investment, we do a couple of reference calls. Um, it's a couple of reference calls with people who know and have followed the business and who share a network with us and therefore care about their reputation in the network. And that's all the diligence we do on 10,000. Um, the, at the 200,000, well, we spent 10 months doing on median of 10 months doing diligence through monthly calls with the company following up with them. Um, one trick which I've seen some angel groups do to move faster is they actually set up a mini fund, uh, which is controlled by the administrator of the angel group, who simply says, I'm going to be into this deal. So, th so the fund, because it's full-time people managing a small pot of money, can decide very quickly, we're in this deal, yes or no. And they can, they can very easily go from already at the first screening phase have an idea of companies they're interested in, do some diligence a few minutes, uh, sort of a few days before the meeting itself, and then within 10 days after the meeting have an offer ready, because they just need to agree themselves as the few people running that fund. And then for the angel group, it's really easy for the angels to co-invest when the mini fund at the heart of the angel group decided to invest. So that's one thing I've seen. I think it's called Maple Leaf Angels here in Toronto did that. And that certainly helped them speed up their time. Because the problem is always it's the lead investor who takes time. And when you have a dance of 10 angel investors who are all sort of interested in the company, but nobody wants to lead, um, and they're doing diligence with their volunteer time when they have it available, that's what slows down. I mean, the biggest, um, I mean, there's two, there's two problems with angel groups. One is you should always be doing meetings every month and have every company who applies to you in a month go into that month's screening meeting because you cannot afford to have a company wait more than a month to go into your, more, more than a month to go into your sort of sc uh, screening slash pitch meeting. You should have a screening meeting followed by a pitch meeting such that a company only takes a month to go through all of that. And then after the pitch meeting, this is the point where if you can get up an accelerated diligence process, that it, it can do it in only sort of 10 days or so before the, the fund at the heart of the angel group is making an investment. Uh, there's a question from Khaled. Are the follow-up rounds coming from Loyal? Uh, we see our co-investment co syndication created by Loyal VC. Um, so follow-up rounds, uh, when we decide to invest in a company, we just do. We'll just put our money out there. Now we do have, we circulate that to our limited partners. We have a mailing list of our limited partners and it's sort of say, hey, we're doing this deal. Um, if anyone's interested, feel free to come along with us. So we do have some of our limited partners who are using us for deal sourcing, who are co-investing directly in our deals. And if as an angel group, you wanted access to global deals, not just those in Bangladesh, um, uh, an investment in Loyal VC could be a way to get that. We don't tend to share our, we don't spend a lot of time pulling together 
other investors for deals. I mean, we think it's, we want to allocate our money where we make the most money. And the, often we will fill a sizable percentage of the round. Um, put it this way, it's just, what do we spend our time on? We spend our time supporting entrepreneurs. That's our number one activity. Um, making deals is sort of a number two. Uh, do, and we're called loyal BC. We have to be loyal to our LPs. We have to give them priority access to all deals. And when you tell other investors, hey, I'll give you access to the deals, which we didn't fill the round ourselves. The company didn't fill the round by us and other investors they know, because often if we lead, others will follow. And or our LPs saw it first, and you're only seeing it sort of fourth on the list. Honestly, most investors at that point say, if I'm going to be fourth on the list, I don't really want the deal flow. So we haven't made it a priority. Um, to, to share those deals outside that close network. If there is a good investor, we'll recommend it. If we think someone's a good fit, we'll recommend they talk to you. Um, but we don't really, we don't do, um, we don't do syndicates because they're too slow. We can make a decision on a deal in a week. Um, we'll just do that. If other people want to join in, we'll happily share our diligence information, but we're not going, we're not someone who spends their time creating syndicates. It's not what we want to be good at. We want to be good at advising companies and making good investments um, from the companies we know. There's another question that I got that um, for moving from uh, the uh, stage one to stage two, which is $200,000 stage, uh, are the terms uh, same for every company or does it no. differ? It's completely different. I mean, if, if a company is doing well and we want to get into the company, we'll pay the terms we need to pay to get in. It's, I, I think that's one of the things, it's really interesting. Um, most VCs and even many angels the criteria they use to invest is to say, I will invest in the best possible company, which is also a blockchain company in Bangladesh um, and a hidden thing with a male CEO, even though they're not saying that. But the more constraints you put on it, the less able you are to do the best possible deal. So what does Loyal say is Loyal says, we have no constraints other than, I mean, the intake constraint to become a pilot company is INSEAD and Founder Institute. But from there, we have no constraints whatsoever. And we're going to put companies into the best possible companies without constraint. Our money goes to the best possible investment without constraint. And I mean, it's sort of obvious when you think about it, and our returns have been excellent. But most people don't think about the best possible use of the money they think about the best possible use of money within these artificial constraints. And we, we just sort of say we should ignore those artificial constraints. Um, uh, Sadman is asking, why do only 30% of loyal VCs money go to companies with uh, women CEOs? Why is it not 50%? Um, very good question. It's something we get from a number of other, um, a number of other, uh, there's a group called Golden Seeds in the US who asks us the same thing. Um, if you look, so first of all, we invest primarily in tech companies. If you look at tech universities, around 30% of graduates and engineering programs is typically around 30% um, female, not 50% female. So certainly what could you do? Change the intake, have 50% of students from engineering programs be women. Have, um, if you look at top accelerator programs like the Founder Institute, like Mass Challenge, um, other groups like that, it's around uh, 30, 35% women again, it's around 30, 35% women out of top MBA programs. So we are matching our intake, which is what's out there. And there's certainly a lot of things you could do to have top MBAs, engineering schools, accelerators, etc., all be 50% women. But what's really interesting is that they are all around 30% women. And yet, when you look at the dollars of venture capital actually going into companies, it's only 3%. So we are doing all the things to take it from 3% to 30% because we want to make money. We are not gender warriors doing this for equality reasons. It's really nice to feel good about the fact that you're doing it. 
but we are fundamentally looking to make money and you make money by investing the best possible deals. And we are finding really good deals overlooked in women because other people don't do that. Um, but we are not, we are not attempting. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of things to do to take it from 30 to 50%. We think it's easy to go from three to 30%. There's a lot of things you need to change in the countries you're working in to take it from 30 to 50 if you're trying to make the best possible investments. Uh, do you have any sector focus or preferred sectors to invest? If yes, what are the preferred sectors for investing? We do not have preferred sectors for investing at all. Um, and I can just, I mean, I can show you very quickly, but I mean, our largest sector is fintech. It's 13%. I think our next largest sectors are, yeah, they drop from there. Good. I should uh, wrap things up here. We have come to sort of end of time. So look, I'd like to thank you all for attending. If you do have other questions, do feel free to, to follow up to email. So that's Kamal at loyal.bc. Thanks everyone for your time.